was a our Father and our God, it is with joy that we stand before your people to give utterance from your word. Thank you that we get to hide in thee. As we sit now to revel in your presence, to hear your voice speaking to our need and our concerns. I pray that our minds and our hearts will be open and in tune to receive your word. And that as a result of receiving it, that indeed it will uh, bring forth fruit for your honor and glory. We are your people. We're in your presence. We need to hear from you today. Speak to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath to each of you. It is indeed good to be with you. That was a powerful hymn. How often in conflict, when pressed by the foe, I have fled to my refuge and breathed out my woe. How often when trials like sea billows roll, I have hidden in thee, <laughs> O thou rock of my soul. What a precious hymn. I was thinking about the, the message this morning and um, I want to share a couple of thoughts here. Um, still trying to figure out which way I'll, I'll start out and take off to this morning. <laughs> um, I'll conclude with uh, the passage in Mark chapter 10 that speaks of the rich young ruler. That's my objective, but that's not where I'm going to start. I'm going to start in the book of Numbers, but um, just know that that was the first thought that came to my mind. I was trying to picture in Scripture where we have individuals running. Yes, we have the father going out to meet the prodigal son, running to meet him. But where do we have individuals running to Jesus? And I thought of uh, Mark 10, uh, maybe 14, 17, I'm somewhere in there, I think it is, uh, that the rich young ruler was observing Jesus. Uh, and it, it, the story is in the synoptic gospels, each of uh, Mark, Luke, John, except um, Mark, Luke, Matthew. <laughs> and um, each of them tells the story a little bit differently. And one calls him a ruler, and the other says he's young, and the other says he's rich. So we title it the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler is observing Jesus bless the children. He takes them into his arms. He has rebuked the disciples who wanted to hush the children away. And Jesus says, forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. And Jesus is blessing the children. And this rich young ruler sees something in that scene that that stirs his heart. And my prayer is that you and I will see something today that will stir our hearts, that compelled him, the rich young ruler, to run to Jesus. I like that notion. So therefore, I titled the, the, the message, Run to Jesus. If ever there was a time that you and I needed to run to Jesus, that's what we ought to do. Uh, make haste. Get to the master today. Make haste. Uh, flee. Don't, don't, don't mess around. Get there. And so with that notion in mind, I then went to the book of Numbers, uh, our main text for today. Let me give you several passages now that you'll want to hold on to for your own study later. As we can, We're going to talk primarily today about the cities of refuge. Yes, it's an ancient story. Yes, it's ancient stuff. Yes, it was in Palestine of old, but it is very much applicable 
today. Sometimes we, we look at the Old Testament, we go, oh, the book of Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that was way back yonder. And that doesn't have much to do with today. But I, I, I beg the, to differ with you. Uh, today, when we, we will consider uh, the, the text that talks about the cities of refuge that uh, Moses were to make sure that the children of Israel set up as they went into the promised land. And so uh, that whole notion of running to Jesus brought that to my mind. So that's where we're going to look today. The main passages are uh, Numbers 35, Numbers chapter 35. We're going to look at verse 6, then 14 and 15 tells us a little bit about it. But uh, you can look in Scripture and uh, many other passages uh, that you will see also alluding to stories centered around um, this, uh, these cities of refuge. We'll hit many of the passages later on today in Deuteronomy, uh, in Exodus. Um, it talks about these cities as well. And then I also want to remind you we, uh, or say to you that we're going to look at several passages in the book of Hebrews. Now, that tells you already that we're going to be talking about the sanctuary. Uh, because when you come to Hebrews, Hebrews is just filled with the sanctuary. So we take the New Testament and the book of Hebrews, and we're going to be talking about that today. And in essence, what we're really looking at is the sanctuary of heaven, the sanctuary of God, the place that you and I find refuge in, the place that you and I can run, hasten to, and hide ourselves in him and be secured from all troubles and trials and perplexities. So let's look first then um, at, the, at our scriptures and we'll go to Numbers 35, and we'll look at 6 and 7, or 6. Numbers 35, turn with me if you will, please. Take a few moments to get to Numbers. Numbers, chapter 35. I went to chapter 5. Why would I do that? Uh, 35. And let's consider verse 6. And among the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities of refuge. Now, notice that they were actually given, the, 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 the Levites were not given specifically uh, a, a land or a territory uh, because God was to be their heritage. Isn't that beautiful? We are Levites. We, are, we ought not get attached to things of earth. All of our property is up yonder. Hello. So don't get so attached to this stuff. So the Levites were not to get attached to uh, physical property and, and, and all of that. Uh, they, they did not have uh, land that was given to them so that they might uh, plant and harvest and all of that. They were to allow the other uh, Israelites to do that. But the Levites were to spend their time in studying and reviewing the law, the Torah, the word of God and teaching and training others in the same light. Hello, isn't that beautiful? That's what we are about, not to get entangled with the stuff around us, but to spend our time in leading others to Christ and teaching uh, the law, the word of God. And this is what the Levites were doing. And then God said to Moses, I want you to give them cities, though. They will have cities to live in. Now, the cities, notice the cities were not uh, agrarian. They were not having the, the property. They did have a few little space, uh, a small space just outside of the city that they could have their cattle there. Uh, but they didn't have land to be, be, to be growing crops and so forth. But they were to have 48 cities, and six of those cities for the Levites were to be cities of refuge. And that's what we want to dwell on today. Among the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities of refuge which ye shall appoint for the manslayer. The manslayer. We'll come to that in a moment. That he may flee thither, and to them ye shall add... 40 and two cities, a total of 48 cities that belong to the Levites. 
Uh, let's go down to verse 14 and get a better understanding um, of these cities. Verse 13. And of these cities which ye shall give, six cities shall be ye have for refuge. Ye shall give three cities on this side of Jordan, the east side, and then three cities on the west side of, of Jordan um, in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. Verse 15, uh, these six cities shall be a refuge both for the children of Israel and for the stranger. Now, I, I, I like this. Notice, it is not just for uh, the Levites. It is not just for the children of Israel, but for the stranger, and not only the stranger, but for the sojourner. Uh, Whoever is passing by for a little while, uh, that they too would be included. This thing called salvation, this haven that we can find in Jesus is not uh, discriminating against anybody, all, whosoever will, let him or her come. So the stranger can come, the, the Israelites can come, the sojourner can come, uh, whoever's among them, everyone that killeth, or anyone that killeth a person unawares may flee thither and find security there in the city of refuge. And this, let me paint the picture for a moment. If, let's say I was out working with a brother and, and we were chopping trees and I inadvertently uh, struck a tree and the ax handle or blade uh, flew off and, and hit the person in the head and it killed him. And I, I did it uh, inadvertently. I did it unintentionally. I had no uh, men's ray. I had no, uh, uh, no malice in my heart. Uh, uh, it was an accident. It was a mistake. Uh, in spite of it being a mistake, the, the brother may have a hot-headed brother or cousin who would want to get even with me, who would want to kill me. You know, there was a law. And this is one of the things I found very interesting ab ab about how God operates. Now, Israel had a, a law in themselves because of the common people around them that if somebody killed one, that you had a right to kill them. Now, listen to what God does. He, he doesn't rebuke and say, don't do that. He just gives them a better way of dealing with how Israel ought to do with it. That if a person were, were killed or if you kill someone accidentally, then you have an opportunity to run to a city nearby and there you could find refuge and stay until the death of the high priest. That's where the book of Hebrews comes in. You can stay until the death of the high priest because there the high priest would be the one that will intercede for you uh, against your enemies that they may not have their sway with you. And therefore, as long as the high priest lived, you were secure in that city of refuge. Now, the way they had those six cities, and I'll name them momentarily, but the way they had those six cities lined up, three on this side of Jordan, three on that side of Jordan, and each of the cities were no more than a half day's journey to the other city. So no matter where you were in the land of Israel, within one day you were able to get to a city of refuge. God was making provision for the one who had inadvertently killed another. And of course, if you did it out of malice, if you laid in wait for him, then you would have no refuge in that city. The elders were to have a trial and to see if in fact it were an accident. And if it were, you could stay in the city. But if you were not, then you were delivered to the family of the people and they would do what uh, they deemed was right to do with you. So it was only if it were not intentionally, if it were accidentally, then you could run to that city. But what you would need to do is get there in a hurry because that hot-headed brother would be on your trail for revenge. And so the sooner you get to the city, the better off you would be, those cities of refuge. Think about it for a moment. We'll talk a little more about the details of 
and they were called cities of refuge. Think about it, if you will. Catastrophic events that shake uh, our nation, shake the earth, uh, wars, international conflicts, national strife, uh, may ravage whole nations, earthquakes that devastate entire cities, uh, fierce uh, tornadoes may destroy neighborhoods, floods that cause havoc in every community, pestilence that destroy uh, the crops and coronavirus, if you will, that may spread with lightning speed around the world, killing tens of thousands of individuals, even with its various strands of, uh, of the virus. At times, our hearts may shake with fear. We long for security. We want a safe place to be. We want to be sheltered from the storms of life. When the citadels of our homes have become, as it were, uh, foxholes and, and uh, barricades and even battlefields while folk are clustered in uh, these environments during the, the, the COVID pandemic. When it appears that there is no place to hide, even at home, Jesus invites us, you and me, to look away from Earth's uh, turmoil or from Earth's trauma and find strength in heaven's sanctuary. <laughs> find strength in heaven's sanctuary. He that dwelleth in the secret high place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. And Jesus bid us look to him in the sanctuary for a place of refuge. Oh, thanks be to God that in spite of all the chaos and the trouble, even in, in, in the home, uh, in, the, in, in the state, in the city, in the, in the country, in the world, we can find solace as we seek him, refuge in him. <laughs> oh, that is good news to me, folks. Where we have a great high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, who forever, whosoever, uh, and not only that, but that high priest lives forever. He's always there to intercede on our behalf. Now, this is the thing that differs from these cities of refuge, that they were, were allowed to be there, or could be there and secure until the death of the high priest. But we have a great high priest, the text tells us, uh, Hebrews 7, and I think it's verse 25, that he ever liveth. In other words, he's after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, he ever liveth to do what? to make intercession for us, to intercede on our behalf. So we always have a great high priest to stand for us and to intercede on our behalf. So we have then no fear. We can run to him to take refuge and solace. Before I describe a little bit more about those cities, I want you to see the parallel between those cities of refuge and our Lord Jesus Christ. The word refuge is metaphorically, it metaphorically stands for uh, our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy, look at that old book again, Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. Look what that text tells us, 33, 27. And it says, there is none like unto the God of Jerusalem, uh, uh, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help and in his excellence on the sky, verse 26. Now verse 27. The eternal God is my refuge. Do you get that? The eternal God is my refuge. So when we talk about these cities of refuge, it's synonymous with the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest. For in those cities of refuge, the high priest was there to intercede on their behalf. Jesus is our high priest. So Deuteronomy 27 makes it clear, there is none like unto thee. 
the eternal God is thy refuge, and beneath are, underneath are the everlasting arms. He shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them, the enemy. So once we find refuge, whether it be disaster, whether it be trauma, whatever the perplexity, we can find solace in Christ Jesus. When I was studying this, this I was moved by that. To know that it does not matter. It really does not matter what goes on around me if I can keep my focus and know that in Christ Jesus, I have an elder brother, a great high priest who is touched with the feelings of my infirmities, who understands, who can empathize with me to the nth degree and who has died so that he now lives and intercede for me, so no matter what, be tied. <laughs> Folk, that is beautiful. I think a few weeks ago I said to you, I would rather uh, be hanging with Christ like the thief on the cross than to be in Pilate's, uh, reigning over Pilate's corpse or uh, sitting on a throne without him. And when I realized that no matter what the turmoil, the situation, that Jesus is available, that he is my refuge, that psalm that we read, Psalm 46 and verse 1, 46 and verse 1, I think it says it very beautifully as well. I want you to get these verses down so you can look at them again and, and, and read them over and over. Psalm 46, 1, our God, or God is our what everybody? Refuge, not only just a refuge, but and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, folk, where, somewhere I have in my notes here to talking about the, 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 the city of refuge. What, what we talk, a refuge is a, is a stronghold. It is a, 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 to have refuge, you must have something that is nearby. You see, that's why the cities of refuge were within a, a half day's journey. It had to be near. See, the Bible says that it's better to have a, 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 a brother near than, you know, was it, uh, than have a friend far away or something like that. Uh, you, you want, if you need help, you want, it to be, get, you want to get it quickly. You want them nearby, in other words. That's what we're seeking. So when we think of refuge, refuge needs to be immediate or nearby. And then that thing that is supposed to be a refuge has to be strong enough to, 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 to keep you uh, lifted up, to, to bore you up, to protect you, to provide for you, whatever it is. And so a thing or a place of refuge has to be available, number one, and has to be strong enough to endure, to protect you. And so the Bible makes it clear that God is our refuge. Uh, God is our strength, a very present help in trouble. Thanks be to God. So these six cities are a sanctuary that's also a type of Christ, our shelter in which the sinner, you and I, can flee to. Now, I won't take time to, to, um, to look at these six cities, but I'll give you some homework to do. Look at the names of these six cities and and look at what they, just the names of them. One was Golan, G-O-G-L-A-N, G-O-L-A-N. Uh, the other was Ramoth, R-A-M-O-T-H, R-A-M-O-T-H. And the third, you could say Bozar or Bezar, B-O-S-O-R or B-E-Z-E-R. Same, and when you deal with the Hebrew, you get different spellings because the words had no vowels in them. And so you had to place the vowels there, so it could go either way. And then that was, those were the cities on the east side uh, of the bank, but then on the other side was Kadesh, K-E-D-E-S-H, Kadesh. Uh, and then uh, Shechem, S-H-E-C-H-E-M, Shechem. 
And then Hebron was the, the third or finally the sixth city, Hebron, uh, which also was on the west side. If you want to do a study, look at the, the Hebrews, these names, and see the significance of the name and see if you do not find in those names delineated the description of a savior or a, a place of refuge. Each of these names symbolize and represents. But we see these six cities and know that these cities were stationed in the area so that no matter where you were at any time, you would be able to get to the city within a half day's journey. Now the Sanhedrin, uh, the, the political arena, had a, 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 an obligation to make sure, and this is what you want to do as, as a Christian today, to make sure that there was nothing on the highway that would keep an individual from getting to where they were going. Now, so the roads that led to these cities of refuge were always clear. They were not doing work on the road and had them closed for several days. Uh, where there were Dale's uh, valleys, they, 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 they built them up so they would not be. Uh, where, where there were uh, uh, hill, hill locks or little mounds or inclines, they leveled those out so you would not have a problem growing tired trying to climb these mountains going up and down. It wasn't like Seattle, <laughs> you know. Uh, you don't have to worry about driving a straight drive in Seattle, like all these hills, you know, you, you have a problem with that. They, they, they leveled the hills out, the valleys, they leveled them out. And so there were straight, plain roads. There were not rocks and things that they could stumble upon and hurt themselves or cause them to be delayed in their journeys to the city. That's why we sing that hymn, Nothing Between my soul and the savior. The highways were clear. They had signage along the way that said refuge. Refuge, so you know you were going in the right direction, particularly when you came to a crossroad that was always clear, distinct lettering, and there were big letters. Remember over in uh, Habakkuk, he says that when he was running that you can read while you're running? So the letters were big enough so that when you're reading, you know, like our, our sign, I hear we, some of you talk about our sign is not big enough to read it, but it, it's predicated that you're gonna be driving less than 35 miles per hour. So if you're driving less than 35, you can read that sign, the church sign out there very well. Now, if you're driving 80, then you're probably not gonna be able to read it. <laughs> you need a bigger sign, you need a bigger lettering. And so it was on those highways, they had it in big letters, refuse, so that while you were running, you could read it while running. You didn't have to stop to read it. Now, praise God, we have to stop at the light out here and read the sign. Now we know what Adventist church is, <laughs> you know. Um, but these cities of refuge, they had great uh, signage there uh, the, 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 on the highway along the way so that you would get there. Nothing would get in the way, no stumbling, nothing in the highway, uh, no pitfalls and challenges. The roads were clear as though a king could travel those highways. So as that proper provision was made for those who were running to those cities. Uh, another area, if you want to study up on the, this area, is in Patriots and Prophets, page 516. That chapter, uh, around, starting around page 514, I think it is. But around page 516 is where I, I got this quote. Uh, By the shedding of his own blood provided for the transgressors, talking about God, provided for the transgressors of God's law, a sure retreat into which they may flee for safety from the second death. Oh, praise God. It's talking about you and I. You and I, we don't have to die. Remember, we have committed sin. The wages of sin is death. Uh, so if we are guilty of anything, we are guilty of murder. For if you commit one, you're guilty of all. So we are murderers, and we are doomed to die. But if you and I will make haste, for the city of God, our refuge in Christ Jesus, we will find there the gates open wide to receive us, and he will in no wise cast us out. Uh, page 517, the Patriots and Prophet says, he who fled to the city of refuge should make no delay. Family and employment were left behind. 
no time to say farewell to anybody. Every other interest must be sacrificed to the one purpose of reaching the place of safety. Did you get that importance? Every other interest were sacrificed, were put on the back burner. I didn't, they did not take time to say farewell. They got to the city and sent a text message back. I'm in the city now. They didn't stop to converse about where I'm going because somebody would be arguing, no, you can't go, wait, let me, let me go with you. I need to pack up some things. No, it takes you two days to pack. I'm going on, you come on behind me. It was that kind of attitude. So they didn't take time to discuss what was going on. Let me get to the city. And then once I'm in the city, safe and secure, I'll send a, a, an emissary back to and tell you what's going on and where I am. But they put all other interests behind. Weariness was forgotten. No matter how tired they were, they pressed on toward the city where they were going for refuge. Difficulties were not heed. The fugitive dared not for one moment slack his pace until he or she were within the city. The sinner is exposed to eternal death. And this is my behavior, uh, sermonic sentence. The sinner was exposed to eternal death until he finds a hiding place in Christ. The sinner, you and I, are exposed to eternal death. Now listen to this. Can you imagine I kill a man inadvertently, I'm back in Palestine now. And there are cities of refuge which I can find to make sure I'm secure. Where I'm there and the high priest will intercede for me and nobody can harm me. I can live and be sustained without problems. And what I would want to do is stay outside and say, no, I'll defend myself. I'll go to court. And I know they'll find me innocent and I'm gonna prove that I'm right. I'm going to prove that I did not do it. That's, in, that's equivalent to the idiot, or better yet, the fool, who seeks to defend himself when God has provided a means of escape, of survival, and we can't do it on our own. We have to go into the city and accept that place of refuge from God himself. That's what we must do. So the sinner, you and I, are uh, exposed to eternal death. Right now, we are. Until we find a hiding place in Christ Jesus. And just as loitering and carelessness might rob the fugitive of his only chance of life. So, listen to me carefully, so delays and indifference may prove the ruin of our own souls. Satan, that great adversary, as Curtis was saying today, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is on our trail. He wants to get us. And do you not know, listen, listen to this. The devil wants you to die in your sin. If he were to kill you right now, how would your soul be? See, he gets us all trapped up in stuff and then he wants to kill us before we can get to our refuge. And so what you and I must do is recognize that we are fugitives, that we have transgressed God's law, that we are doomed to death, and we must get inside the city of refuge. Christ Jesus, our elder brother, who intercedes for us, that's what we must do. God help us. As I 
moved toward a conclusion. I got a little bit yet. But I want to start thinking in these terms. Um, I think of the, the lepers over in, uh, I think it's the book of Kings. Can't remember now reading through the Bible again, whether it's first Kings, second Kings, but you know those lepers that were sitting outside the, the camp of Israel and there was four of them and uh, they were not allowed to go into the city. And they said to themselves, if we sit here, we will but die. <laughs> and we can't go into our own camp. Then they thought, let's go into the camp of the Assyrians. I mean, the worst thing that could happen to us is that they would kill us. I mean, we're going to die anyway. We sit out here, we're going to die of starvation. But they went into the city of the Assyrians and they found them empty and all the booty was there for their own personal gain. Look at what we have to gain by seeking the city of refuge that God has provided for us in Christ Jesus. Now, having said that, let me share something with you that you will find shocking. And if you find me wrong, please call me, email me, text me. I looked and I've read the Bible a few times. I have yet to discover in scripture anybody who took advantage of the city of refuge. Now, isn't that an anomaly? <laughs> we have these cities that God was very intentional about making sure that they were there as they went into the promised land. Both sides of the Jordan River, these cities. That the highway was clear. There was no stumbling blocks, no hills, no valleys. And yet, as I read through scripture, I have not discovered any person that took advantage of those cities of refuge. Don't let that be you. Now, so I would admonish you to do as the rich young ruler, run to Jesus, run to him in a hurry. Now, while there were not individuals that ran to those cities of refuge, I do find individuals who found their solace, their refuge in Jesus Christ. That bad boy, Manasseh. As bad as he was, the record is he humbled himself and turned to his God. And no matter how bad he was, the gates, the doors, the arms, were open wide to receive him. Read it over in the Gospels again. There was this Mary of Magdalene. Mary of Magdalene. Bad woman, as it were. Seven devils cast out of her. I mean, we could probably get more than that cast out of us, right? Come on now, no need to point fingers at her. Seven devils. But what did she do? She kept returning to Jesus running to him. So it doesn't matter how bad we become. If we would pause long enough to seek his face, to turn from our wicked ways, then he'll hear from heaven and forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness righteousness. It is not enough that the sinner believe in Christ for pardon of his sins. Listen to me carefully on this. Whew. See if I can get some help now. <laughs> it's not enough just to believe. What did the man slayer what did he have to do? Something that Shimei didn't do that he promised to, to uh, Solomon that he would do. Help me out, some of you Bible scholars now. 
What did Shimei promise Solomon that he didn't do, that the manslayer must do, and that you and I must do? Can I get some help, online or in person? And I'm challenging you because I want you to get it. The believer did not have to just believe there was something else he had to do, a key, key word here, key word I'm looking for. Obey. Mm. Oh, yeah, he had to obey. He had to, yeah, but that's not the one I'm looking for. Another key word. When we find our refuge, then what must we do? Trust. Any help back there, Mike, on, on, online? No? Nobody taking, the, taking the, a stab at it. Stay in the refuge. enough to believe and to obey. Let me tell you what Shimei did, you see. Remember when he cursed David and David came back when David was barefoot and walked across and he was throwing stones at him and he came back. When David came back, you know, the king, uh, uh, Shimei was out there apologizing and David said, I'm not going to kill you, you know, but then David on his dying bed said to Solomon, Shimei did me wrong. He cursed me. Don't let his hoary head go down to the grave in peace. And so Solomon, when David died, called Shimei and said to him, I tell you what you do. You build you a house right here in Jerusalem and you don't go out of it because the day you leave from Jerusalem is the day you die. <laughs> And one of his donkeys got away from him, and he went looking for it. Uh, not, I think it was a donkey. It might have been a manservant. Somebody left, and it might have been an animal. At any rate, Shimei left town. And when Solomon found out, Shimei lost his life. When the manslayer ran to that city of refuge, this is the thing about having a refuge, folks. He or she was to abide in that city of refuge. <laughs> it wasn't just enough to believe I have security and safety inside the city. Thank you. When I find that city, when I find that place, is that John 15? You see that word abide about 11 times there? We must get into, get the, our great high priest. And once we are under the shadow of the almighty, we have our refuge in him. Then you and I are to abide with him and not leave for our only safety and security is to abide in him. When the blood was put on the doorpost, the Israelites were not to go outside the house. They were to abide in the house under the blood. That's where we are. Let every one of us commit ourselves to dwelling in the city of refuge, Christ our Lord. For it is only here that we will live in safety, both now and in the future. So I close with those words of my behavior purpose. Sinner, flee to thy refuge. Abide in him. Accept his love. Receive his forgiveness. Ask him for the power to live a new life. That's my behavior purpose, my challenge to you today with this message, understanding this great high priest we have, that he bids us come to me, run to me, haste, don't waste time, haste, flee to thy refuge, abide in him, accept his love, receive his forgiveness, ask him for the power to live a new life. And I like the words of that hymn, him 509, they're going to play it for us in just a moment. The soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, he will not desert to his foe. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, he'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Run to Jesus. Let's hear the hymn now, hymn 509. That soul that seeks him, that runs to him, 
will never, never, never be forsaken. Listen to that verse four, uh, five, uh, four once again. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. Listen to that. That's beautiful. The flame, the difficulty you're dealing with shall not hurt thee. I only designed the flame to consume the dross. <laughs> I'm preparing you for your eternal home with me, says Jesus. Your permanent place of refuge. Dear God, help us as we consider our plight and our condition to hasten, to run to Jesus, to find there the solace and the, the refuge and the security and the safety and the sanctification that we need in this time of trouble, of difficulty, oh God. We need a savior and a friend and we can find it in you. Thank you for giving us this wonderful illustration, this wonderful metaphor of the cities of refuge. And Lord, it's just a day's journey, even a half day's journey. Lord, if we just confess with our mouth just now, you will save us. May we not hesitate, may we not postpone May we seek you just now. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now may the good Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The good Lord lift up his countenance upon each of you and grant to you his eternal peace. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath.